We turn now to Mark chapter 11 and uh, try to understand the teaching of our passage under the title given, The King's Authority. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus has entered into Jerusalem as king and received the homage of countless thousands, verses 1 to 11. The following day, Jesus enters into the temple at Jerusalem, and there he clears out the money changers and he cleanses the temple single-handedly and authoritatively. And the day after that, uh, a deputation of the highest court uh, in the land amongst the Jews approach Jesus in the light of the events of the previous day, and they ask him the obvious and all-important question, verse 28, by what authority do you do these things? The king's authority is uh, the subject this morning, and what a huge subject it is with massive implications this day for the world of human beings, for the people of Scotland, and particularly for the disciples of Jesus Christ. In life, there is that inherent insecurity, and in particular, global financial security in our days. So the question, and wherein lies ultimate authority. Now, you will know by now that two great themes uh, occupy Mark and his gospel. One, the person of Christ. Two, the nature of discipleship. And the two belong together. For how can anyone become a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ without being convinced of the comprehensive authority of of this King of kings and, and Lord of lords? And you only grow in the life of discipleship as you depend upon the authority of Jesus and are assured of that. And I can't help wondering if perhaps some of us in our Christian lives are lacking assurance because of the lack of clarity concerning the authority of the King over our lives and in our lives. That is, as we function in our lives, to use Timothy Keller's expression, the minister and preacher from Manhattan. Uh, Keller says, you can on a Sunday morning believe with the top of your head that all authority is his in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28. But what about on Monday morning with the bottom of your heart and in the week coping with trials and troubles and, and temptations? The great question is, how do we function And it's possible to function as Christians without any real reliance and reassurance about the great authority of Jesus Christ in our lives. Now, the term authority in our day means different things to different people. The Greek word for authority used three times in verse 28, 29, and 33, in essence means the right and might to act. And Jesus' divine authority of Son of God in the Gospels refers to His complete and unrestricted prerogative and power to teach, to act, and to save. Now, the king's authority is mentioned mainly in our passage in terms of the king's authority in judgment, verses 12 to 19. But there is also in our passage a reference to the king's authority in grace, verses 20 to 25. So we look at these two dimensions. First of all, beginning with his authority in judgment. Now, the section beginning with verse 12 It starts with the miracle of the withering of the fruitless fig tree. And this is the only destructive miracle of Jesus recorded in the whole of the Gospels. And because of that, it has posed great problems for numbers of people. 
Jesus' action here seems to be out of character, that is, with his meekness and lowliness. And yet, meekness is never to be confused with weakness. But in addition, Jesus' action seems to contradict reason. After all, it wasn't the season for figs. And yet, this tree shows a a remarkable and surprising amount of foliage. And foliage was supposed to follow after the first fruits. But what's the point? What's this miracle all about? Why is it that Jesus would channel his divine power in something which is essentially negative? Well, the point is really quite clear in the text. And by that I mean the way that Mark style has a style of writing and describes some of his stories. Let me explain. People have pointed out that Mark, compared with the other gospel writers, uses a technique that's called interweaving. That's to say, he mentions a topic, and then he mentions another topic, then he comes back to the first topic. Or to put it in another way, he he uses what's called the sandwich technique. He has a main story, but uh, it's sandwiched between another story in two parts. You see that with the raising of Jairus' daughter in in chapter 5. And and that seems to be the sandwich technique that's used here as Mark tells the story. The main story is the cleansing of the temple. There it is in, in, in verses 15 to 19. But it's sandwiched between another story about a fig tree, but it's in two parts. There's the cursing of the fig tree, verses 12 to 14, and then the withering of the fig tree in verses 20 and 21. Now, because of this sandwiching and this close connection, it really indicates the interpretation. The fig tree is pointing to the cleansing of the temple. The point of the fig tree and its withering is that it is an authoritative judgment, at least it's speaking about that, an authoritative judgment upon the temple and upon Israel. One of the first commentaries on Mark ever written was by Victor of Antioch, who says this, the withering of the fig tree was an active parable in which Jesus used the fig tree to set forth his judgment that was about to fall on Jerusalem the king's authority in judgment. Now, some of you who know your Bibles well are probably asking the question to yourself, are there two cleansings of the temple or one? Because you remember way back in John's gospel, near the beginning of the gospel, there's a cleansing of the temple, which seems to take place right at the start of Jesus' three-year ministry. And then there's this cleansing of the temple here in Mark chapter 11, which seems to take place right at the end of his ministry, in in the very last week, to be precise. So are there two cleansings, or, or just one mentioned twice in different places for different purposes of the writers? Well, I have to say that the natural reading of John's cleansing and uh, of of Mark's cleansing reads uh, as two separate events. And I think it's helpful to know that John's Gospel in the first five chapters has much material that's not recorded in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But you say, could the authorities possibly have allowed Jesus to do this a second time? And the answer is yes, according to Professor Don Carson and his massive commentary on John's Gospel in the light of the first cleansing taking place three years previously. Carson asks, could the Jewish authorities possibly have guarded the the sanctuary and the temple indefinitely? Of course not. And after a month, they would have concluded that lightning can strike in the same place twice, but of course it did. But when we come to Mark's cleansing of the gospel in chapter 11, it really does seem to be the last straw for the Jewish authorities. In a way that it isn't in John's cleansing. Only in Mark 11 and verse 18 do we read, and they began to look for a way to kill him. And of course, in a few days' time, that's what they did. And that was their ultimate condemnation. Condemnation. 
And that brought the judgment, the authoritative judgment upon Israel. And so the fig tree is a kind of acted prophecy of judgment. The tree is favored. It flatters to deceive with all its outward show, and it is utterly fruitless. The king's authority and judgment. But what was it that was wrong with the religion of Israel at this time? Well, the temple tells us. The temple is the focus here of this passage. And the temple, I suppose, in Jerusalem was for the nation what uh, Buckingham Palace, Westminster Abbey, and the Houses of Parliament are for for London and and, and our nation, only much more in the case of of the temple at Jerusalem, because, because Israel was God's holy nation, called to evangelize the whole world. And the temple was a kind of symbol of this calling and and the center for it. I mean, you see that in the way the the temple was constructed with all its 30 acres of, of, of land. It was constructed in terms of courts. Right at the center of the temple was the court of priests. And then behind that, there was the court for the Israelites. And then beyond that was the court of women. And beyond that, there was this vast area in which this event takes place known as the Court of Gentiles. And the Court of Gentiles had an evangelistic purpose. The whole purpose was for outsiders to come in and to learn of God and know Him and worship Him. That was the purpose of the Court of Gentiles. But what was it used for now? Well, we all know from, from the Scriptures. It was used for money changing, for the temple taxes. And so the whole area was, was crowded with, with tables and, and benches and, and money changers. The area was used also for animal sacrifices. And so there were more stalls and, and high-pressure sales with hyper-inflated prices. William Barclay tells us that outside the temple... In the city, you could buy a pair of doves for sacrifice for the equivalent of three and a half P. Inside, 75 P. Well, that's what I call galloping inflation. So you see what what had happened to this area. It was now used for fundraising, for the maintenance of the status quo instead of mission to the outside world. And it was this complete negation of the evangelistic purpose and calling for Israel that seemed to bring forth Christ's authoritative judgment. This place is to be a house of prayer for all nations, he says in verse 17. Instead, it's become a den of robbers. And I wonder what the outsiders thought about this. If they still came to the court of Gentiles, perhaps they had long since voted with their feet, as is the case in most of Scotland nowadays in connection with the Christian church. You know, if you remember after Jesus died and rose and ascended back to heaven, He comes in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, to seven churches in Asia. And in a very real sense, He is still scrutinizing His temple in these letters. That is to say, the lives of those who profess to be His in His churches. And He is, as the Lord of the church, uh, assessing the lives of His people and, if necessary, addressing those where there is fruitlessness or bad fruit. And He brings a word of repentance before it is too late. And we assume that the Lord of the church is is still today scrutinizing His temple, scrutinizing our lives to see if there is fruitfulness. He looks to see whether the so-called fruits of the Spirit are are there in abundance, particularly Monday to Saturday, not just on, on Sunday, but during the week. Are they there? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. 
Are there these fruits? And is there the consequent fruitfulness? That's to say, the attraction and the, the impact and the influence upon others. Not necessarily their conversion, that's in God's hands, but some kind of impact upon those whom we rub shoulders with day in, day out, and week in and week out. You remember the Lord's words, the king and head of the church says concerning his people in the Revelation, he says, I, I know your deeds, your hard work and perseverance, but I have this against you that you've lost, you've lost your first love. And the fruit of the Spirit is love. And all that flows from that, we need to know that without exception, Jesus means what He says when He calls for repentance. So it is a word of challenge here as we think of the King's authority in judgment. But side by side with that, as there is in the authentic biblical gospel, there is the King's authority in grace, verses 20 to 25. Learn from the fig tree. And there is another lesson here, a lesson which seemed to impress itself upon Mark and the early church. Remember, this letter was written round about 60 A.D. and probably from Rome. And the lesson is about faith in the gospel of grace. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Verse 22, and presumably he answered because of an implied question in the previous statement of Peter. Peter says, Luke, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And the implied question, how this power? And the implied answer here, by grace through faith. Here's the truth and teaching for us this morning. The king's authority and grace is held out to his people, but it has to be received by faith. Now, there's a staggering statement about faith in verse 24. Let me read it to you again. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. What an amazing, astonishing statement about faith active in prayer. Now, taken by itself, rested away from the rest of the verses, or indeed from the rest of the Bible, and taken on its own, that statement might produce in us something which George Philip called auto-suggestion in, in his book, um, Grace from Mark's Gospel. That's to say, we, we, we try and work up that belief within us that what we are asking for in prayer must happen. George Philip goes on to say this, Yes, we must pray in faith, not in doubt, but when our focus is on our praying and the answer we want rather than on God, His perfect will and His perfect power, we can become confused and fall into error. People can even become crippled with, with guilt, feeling if only I engaged in more faith. That's a very perceptive and helpful warning. What can we say then about this amazing offer and promise of grace in verse 24? Let me quickly say four things. First of all, this authoritative promise of grace in verse 24 is to do with the removing of mountains. Remember the context in uh, Verse 23, I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt, it will be done for him. This was a Jewish expression. A Jewish rabbi or teacher who encountered huge difficulties in 
the disciples' minds and who overcame them was known as a mountain remover. So are you faced with some kind of perplexity or difficulty or problem which is going to require some kind of answer of wisdom and discernment? Are you facing that this, this week or even this very morning? If so, what do you do? Well, we turn to the authoritative promise of grace that is given to us by the King. Let me point you to the most amazing promise of grace for wisdom that we find in, in the Scriptures, I believe, James chapter 1 and verse 5. If anyone lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without finding fault. Now, that's the Word of Almighty God. It's comprehensive. It's for all. It's universal. It's for anyone. And it's gracious. He says He gives generously. God cannot deceive or fail in this. But it has to be received with faith because verse 5 follows verse 4, as you'd expect which says this, but let him ask in faith and not doubt. For he who doubts is like a wave tossed to and fro by the wind. Let him not think that he will receive anything from God. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So have faith in God for the removing of these mountains and the finding of particular wisdom that you need. Secondly, this amazing authoritative promise of grace perhaps highlights more than anything else that there is such a thing as a sovereign gift of special faith for a special occasion. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to take the interpretation of this verse, and if I remember rightly, he often used the illustration of George Muller to amplify what he was meaning. Muller, the great founder of orphanages down in, in the Bristol area in the 19th century. And perhaps you know the story of, of Muller. It's been well recorded many times. He would find himself facing a mountainous problem for the feeding of the orphans because there was no food and no money. But again and again, God seemed to give Muller a special faith. And he quietly and persistently kept believing God, and right enough, at the eleventh hour, very often the eleventh and a half hour, sometimes the money came in. If you know anything of this special kind of faith in any measure or degree in your life as an individual or in the fellowship, thank God for it, and go on persevering in prayer, because sometimes you have to wait until it's, it's realized. Have faith in God. I mean, we know what the Bible tells us. That without faith, it's impossible to please God. Those that believe in Him and come to Him must know that He is and the rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. And you know, I find myself more and more in these weeks having to take myself in hand and ask myself the question, do I really believe God? Do I really believe Jesus and all that's revealed about Him? Do I really, really believe in what He teaches and says and offers? And if so, why is it that I get weighed down when problems and difficulties come? I have faith in God. The third thing to say is that uh, we have to relate verse 24 and the invitation of prayer to other Scriptures which speak about instruction in prayer. For example, the very next verse in verse 25 uh, reminds us of the necessary uh, condition of forgiving other people. 
and think of the great priority that we get in the instruction on prayer in the Scriptures to the will of God as being primary. Think of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And Jesus himself, eh, in a few chapters later on in Mark's Gospel, shows us the connection between faith and the will of God in the Garden of Gethsemane, chapter 14 and verse 36. Remember how he says, Father, all things are possible to you. Faith. But then see that submission to the will of God. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as you will. The will of God then is absolutely paramount for the expression and channeling of faith into that avenue and direction contained by God's plan, purposes, and will. Have faith in God. The fourth thing to say is that this gracious promise in verse 24 is to lead us to the gracious authority of Christ in dispensing salvation. For example, there may be somebody here this morning who finds it difficult that his or her sins can ever be forgiven. Sins in the past. Sins in the present which are too private, sins in the future which will be too ingrained. And oh, the guilt that this induces, and the dread, and the fear. How can God ever forgive my sins? This promise points us to the gracious authority of our Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. Matthew 9, verse 9, speaking to the paralyzed man. Jesus says, you remember, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Get up and go home. Let's apply that truth to us here because one can be paralyzed with guilt and paralyzed with dread and fear. And the word for us and for such is this, is this arise in fresh trust in the gracious authority of the King to dispense forgiveness freely and fully to you. In that sense, get up and believe. And then after the service, go home. Or if you want another promise, an authoritative promise of grace to help you, then go on to 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is the most glorious promise, uh, perhaps in the whole of the Scriptures, for those who are ridden with guilt of sin. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The authority of the King in grace. The chief priests never got an answer to their question in verse 28. For in verse 33, Jesus says, I won't tell you. The King never discloses His grace to those who are not serious and in earnest with Him. So don't be like the chief priests this day, this morning, this moment afresh. Yield to the King's authority in your life. Submit to His right and might to be your Savior and your Lord. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. May God bless His Word. Let's pray together. We bow in Your majestic presence, O Lord, and worship You as King and Lord and head over all things. And we bring our lives, 
in all their frailty and vulnerability, in all their need and sinfulness before you, and cast ourselves afresh upon your marvelous mercy, your great grace, and your limitless love, and ask that you will hear our cries, and you will work in our hearts and bring this message and word into the very deep springs of our being that we might there resolve afresh to trust you, to believe you, and to obey you, and to go out into life in this coming week to serve you under your authority and in the light of your glorious grace. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in these moments of quietness for the working of your Holy Spirit and to bring into our minds and our souls that which you want to say to us and which we need to hear. And we ask this, that your kingdom might grow and extend intensively in our lives and extensively through this congregation. And all for Jesus' honor, in whose name we pray. Amen.